I'm really happy with the turnout, you guys. Thank you so much for taking time out of your morning. I know everyone's super busy with their plans, but um, this is kind of a select opportunity that we have. Today we have Darla Inglis with us, and she actually was a stormwater manager for many years for the city of Seattle. Um, so she has a long background in stormwater management and low impact development design. Everyone knows that's what LID means, right? Low impact development. Um, so Darla was actually recruited by the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board to come here and help municipalities implement low impact development design and thereby um, comply with the stormwater requirements that all the cities are having to deal with. And you guys have become intimately familiar with that over the past couple of years. So Darla's here to give her presentation on low impact development, kind of a general approach, um, and it mirrors in a lot of ways our storm water management guidance manual that's hopefully becoming somewhat of a Bible to some of you in implementing, helping me implement, helping the city implement the stormwater requirements. So with that, we'll get, let Darla get started. Oh, everyone signed in. We'd like to document everyone who's here. The sign-in sheets are up there. Great, thanks, Adam. So as, as Autumn mentioned, uh, I was recruited here to help with low-impact development and stormwater implementation on the Central Coast. And uh, one of the items that I've been assisting municipalities with is coming and talking about the LID design training, what steps for a project to get post-construction uh, stormwater management in place and integrated into the project. What are the series of steps that you need to go through to try to make that a successful project? And I've done about uh, 19 presentations now, uh, different cities and counties, and I believe yours is the first where I think we're going to switch the, you're, we're going to turn the tables a bit. You've got this excellent manual that you have that I, I believe most of you have gone through some level of training for. Uh, I won't be able in our half hour, 40 minutes that I'm going to be giving a presentation to go into the level of depth that you have in this manual. But more in talking with Cameron and Autumn, doing a little bit of a refresher on some of those LID steps. And really, we're going to be turning the tables and talking about some of the projects that you have and that you've encountered and the difficulty or the uh, maybe ease in which you've been able to implement your LID requirements as a city. And I want to be asking you questions about where some of those um, constraints and pressure points might be in implementation. Because overall, um, I'm also assisting the Water Quality Control Board in how they're going to be looking at the stormwater requirements for coming years. And so really understanding what it means on the ground for a city or county to implement LID is really going to help ultimately all of us in getting something good on the books that's going to work for everybody. So we're going to spend um, a fair amount of time, I believe, Autumn and Cameron, in, in going through some actual project plans that, that you have. So that will be an emphasis of today. And just uh, as a reminder, or for me, most of you all here in the audience are primarily planners, plan review folk. Is that true? Do we have engineering design as well and engineering review and things like that? And most of the planners. OK, great. So I'm going to go back to some very basics, but we'll go through it very, very quickly. So this is that common slide that is seen from the Center for Watershed Protection about the impacts of urbanization. Um, with all the types of natural processes that were in place before we develop a landscape, where you've got rain comes down and generally you have a fair amount of vegetation, you get canopy interception, so the water will hit a leaf or a branch and kind of move slowly down before it actually hits the ground. You get evapotranspiration from vegetation, even from Mediterranean vegetation. This picture obviously shows a bunch of trees, but even with Mediterranean uh, climate vegetation, you get a lot of that slowing down. And you get a lot of infiltration that goes into either your shallow subsurface layer that kind of moves laterally maybe to a creek or deeper infiltration that'll go down into a base flow and recharge maybe a groundwater aquifer. And the surface runoff arrow is very small. The actual amount of surface runoff that you see in natural conditions is usually very small or, or generally non-existent. I had seen a lot of papers in the literature in past years about scientists looking for what they called Horton overland flow, really where you could see overland flow. And the only places they would generally see it would be in the southwest where you get a lot of that flash flooding, so you definitely surface, see surface water runoff. But in most areas, Mediterranean forested, when it rains, you wouldn't see a lot of surface runoff. Then on the right-hand side, here's the, the urbanization illustration. And you get less vegetation, so less of those plants to kind of capture some of the energy of that rain. 
um, less evapotranspiration, and a lot more hard surfaces or the impervious surfaces like the roads and streets that are going to limit the amount of infiltration. So all of a sudden now you have a huge amount of surface water runoff that's going downstream or down gradient. It's causing erosion. It's carrying pollutants. Um, there's a nice explanation of, of these processes in your, in your manual. And it's also capping, essentially. The impervious surface is capping over the landscape, and so you're getting less infiltration into your inner flow and into your aquifer. So I've had some people ask me about, well, gee, we don't have a, a creek downstream of our urban areas, and so um, we're not getting any hydro modification impacts, right? But they've got groundwater aquifers that are very important for drinking water or other uses, and hydro modification or that change in the landscape pattern for water runoff is limiting what they've got for their groundwater resources. So the changes in the, hydro the hydrology is really an impact across the board. And one of the things this region, this Central Coast region water board is looking at are the changes to hydro modification, not just, not just the creek impacts, which is there's been a lot of emphasis in this state nationally about hydro modification being all about creeks. And you certainly have creeks here in the city. But now there's starting to be a more broader awareness that hydro modification impacts other aspects of the hydrologic cycle. So groundwater recharge, for example. And anybody feel free to jump in with questions as we're moving through this. And then historically, stormwater management, oh, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, was really about public health property protection. It was still when there was uh, sewage going into the street, there were, um, you know, horses still on the street, and it was really about disease and just getting water away from people because of disease. To some degree about some property protection, but mostly about getting um, disease-laden water away from people. And then as we moved into um, essentially the, I'd say the early 80s or the 70s with the Clean Water Act, there was more of this awareness of water quality impacts, in particular pollutants. And sort of these peak flows, these big flows that would cause flooding, public property damage, or even erosion to creeks. And so we entered this era of some level of peak flow control and water quality. It was the era of the big ponds, the detention ponds, and the big detention vaults that were meant to capture these big peaks of water reduce flooding, capture some of the pollutants that would fall out from the sediments. But that was basically it. In the last couple decades, there's this, this increasing awareness then that that has not been enough, that the way that we were managing stormwater uh, was still not enough to protect natural resources and as well as flooding considerations that were very expensive to deal with. So now we're in this era where I think the term that's used most is we t we're talking about mimicking natural functions. It's like, okay, We've done sort of these uh, hardwired type approaches, and really it must be that the trick to managing stormwater is if we can manage it more like nature would manage it or mimic it, then theoretically we would do a better job at protecting natural resources. And so for better or worse, this term LID now sort of means everything. Low impact development is really about mimicking natural hydrologic functions as a way to manage stormwater. And nationally, the, the, um, the National uh, Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit requirements for post-construction are now really influencing, as you know, what projects look like. And it doesn't really matter. The, the picture on the left there is the city of Seattle, one of the bioretention systems that was done as part of a green or complete street design, so residential neighborhood. Uh, swale, obviously a lot of vegetation, very lush. The picture on the right is from uh, city of Reno. Same design concept, bioretention, soils, infiltration, vegetation, obviously very different looking because of the climate. But the, the point being that the design principles and how we're managing stormwater has been changing in the last decade or so drastically from those detention ponds and vaults to now these types of engineered natural looking systems. They may have soils, they may have vegetation, they may be pervious pavements, but they're all about trying to induce um, processes and functions that are like nature. So LID, probably the most common uh, terminology aspects is that it mimics the pre-development site hydrology. And mimic doesn't necessarily always mean match it exactly, but it's mimicking. So your, your lawyers and your regulators can talk about that term mimic. But it's trying to copy how nature does it. And it uses both structural and non-structural techniques. And this is a very important aspect because many times 
people who are implementing LID tend to focus really on the structural elements, you know, the, the stuff that you're used to seeing, like the rain gardens and pervious pavements. But as important are the site planning tricks that we'll be talking about in ultimately having sort of an optimal LID design site. And then these things are used, and it's again, it's about the hydrology, storing, infiltrating, evaporating, detaining runoff. What we'll talk about in a couple minutes is the fact that if LID is a focus on hydrology, sometimes you're going to get plans, and maybe you do get plans that come across your desk, where it looks like something that's LID, meaning it looks like it's green, maybe it's got vegetation, but maybe it's designed only to address water quality. And so in the strictest way that everybody's tending to use the term LID, that kind of BMP would not suffice as doing LID because it's only doing water quality and maybe all the water is still moving off the site. And LID, again, is looking at the hydrology and managing the hydrology. So we'll pick up that kind of myth or misunderstanding a bit more. The design process that I've been using with the other cities and counties in this region is listed here on the left. It, just so you know, it essentially mirrors what is in your BMP manual. Uh, states it maybe a little bit differently, but the steps that are outlined in your manual are essentially the steps that are outlined here. Um, you are in, the city of Santa Barbara as well as all the other cities and counties in the Central Coast are in a hydro modification development process right now as a joint effort all together developing numeric criteria um, that will be put in place uh, two years from this last October. You have interim numeric criteria that you're asking um, developers to put in place for projects, for applicable projects. But just so you know, the Water Quality Control Board has this BMP that's listed up here for LID that it says, during this two-year period, while all these cities are working on their hydro modification plan together, during this two-year period, you need to apply LID principles and features to all applicable new and redevelopment projects. And the LID principles and features, in order to understand how to do that, it's going through this flowchart on the left, which again mirrors what is in your manual. Um, most of the cities and counties that I'm working with don't have anything on the books right now. Um, you, as a city, are probably one of the most advanced in the region for at least having these principles documented and understanding a lot of the structural BMPs, what kinds of projects trigger those requirements. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background to understand that this city is also in this process for a two-year period where you're going to be documenting your process and documenting the projects that you're actually um, requiring LID to be conducted. So we'll go through some of these at a much higher level than, again, is what is in your manual. Um, you, again, you've got your post-construction BMP manual, and in your manual, you've got a flow chart that essentially says the types of projects where you're going to require um, LID, either structural elements, and it gives you an outline. I'm sure you're all familiar with these three tiers that you have for different project sizes that are going to trigger requirements. So you've got already a flow chart and understanding of when an applicant comes to the counter, are they going to have to do anything at all? If they have to do something, how much do they have to do? So you've already got a process in place. Most cities and counties in the region aren't at this point yet to even understand which projects they're going to require LID. But you've got a good start in understanding that with your flow chart. So assessing the project site. Um, this is getting into the physical conditions of the site to consider the main one. I've listed the main ones here, um, such as listing out the topography, the different setbacks that you might have, the soils. Uh, what I've been hearing from most folks is that they generally ask for the soil information later on in the project development process. So the idea of getting soils information earlier in the kind of pre-application period has been created a little bit of attention or a little bit of confusion in bringing that information, sp the developer having to spend that money to understand the soil conditions earlier on than they, they would have. But in order to understand how you're going to deal with the hydrology, what structural BMPs you might be able to put in, you have to know a little bit about the soils right from the get-go. Um, other information that, that you deal with all the time, um, whether or not there's any environmentally sensitive areas, any existing underground infrastructure that might be in place, and then the hydrology of the site as a whole. 
I don't know if you use maps um, in your pre-application process for the hydrology so that you, p you can look and see what kinds of on-site features you might have that are going to influence the stormwater management plans. So that might be the existing flood, flood paths, any flood plains that might be at the site, the depth of groundwater always being a really important one, especially if you're going to try to be promoting any sort of infiltrative practices. If the groundwater is too high, it may not be feasible. What sort of receiving waters you have, and that's going to influence. If you have a standing body of water as a receiving water body, you may not be as concerned about erosivity than if you were to have a stream downstream from the site. Or maybe you might be concerned with uh, particular pollutants of concern. I'm curious to know how much of this do you request in your pre-application period? Any of this type of information to help you understand the site or pre-application meeting? Okay. And that includes this uh, type where you get the topography and the whole deal. And for those of you who have worked through a project, has that timing been sufficient for you? Or you go back and say, wow, if we had sort of known some of that information earlier in the process, we might have been able to help guide or direct the process differently. Or, it, or does it seem like the way that you've got it in right now seems to be, to be working? Seems to be working. Don't get the soils data up front, and, and have you then run into problems where later somebody's saying they can't do it because of the soils, okay, which is a pretty common, common thing. Okay, so soils. Soils does seem to be the one where people are sort of reevaluating whether or not it would be more useful to have that up front, at least some a high level, you know, not going through a very extensive geologic review, but maybe just a little bit to understand um, the site constraints or opportunities. Okay. So again, much more detail in your, in your own manual on site assessment. I don't know, um, Autumn or Cameron, if you wanted to add any zingers to your site assessment related to how you do the process. I can actually say something. Because yeah. Because my kids are not here, they're in the microphone. Um, one of the things that I know is coming up a lot is when applicants complain that there's a late hit, right? Because they've already kind of designed their project, they have an idea of what they want to put on the on the site. And so I, that's something that we've really been trying to, in our individual meetings that we get together with planners, um, that the site assessment up front before the project even is um, fully planned out is, is kind of the, the major benefit that, a, that an applicant can have. So. Um, the late hit complaint is something that I think really just drives back to that. Um, I had another point about it, but I forget what it was. Anyway, keep talking. I'll jump in. Yeah, it's cheaper. You save a lot of money if you do the site assessment up front. That's just the main thing is the project applicant saves money in the long run. And that might just be a learning learning curve. Folks start learning that to do it, it's cheaper that way. They're going to start learning to come into the process earlier. You'll learn more to be asking for that information earlier. But there is that transition period where the information doesn't come in soon enough, and you end up having to do the iterative process more in the design. It's a good point. And then defining defining the stormwater goals. You have some stormwater goals that I'm going to put up, or stormwater um, numeric criteria that you have in place right now. But I wanted to point out, just from an, a background understanding how this is being looked at in the state, there are different regulatory requirements, and they and they tend, for better or worse, to be divided right now into the water quality requirements and any of the flow control requirements. And, and then there's always flood control requirements, but I'm, I'm sticking to the environmental elements right now. In the water quality requirements, oftentimes the language that um, will be seen is treat the 85th percentile runoff volume. You're, you're treating a certain size storm. It tends to be the small storm that's carrying most of the pollutants. Um, sometimes, it, and it's stated as a volume that you can treat. Sometimes it's treated as a flow rate. So you've got to treat a certain size event that's, uh, that generates a certain intensity of flow, and you've got to treat it to some standard. 
The HydroMod requirements, again, more about managing sort of the amount of water and how fast it's coming off the site, can be anything from reduce or match a peak runoff. So pre-post development, there's that high peak that you get that if you didn't have any controls on the site, the water would run off faster and a, a greater peak. And so it's saying you got to bring that peak down and match um, maybe a pre-development peak. You get hydrograph matching requirements that might say if the pre-development hydrograph is nice and smooth like this, then your pre and post has to match that hydrograph. That really throws people for a loop. Um, sometimes it may be to retain this a volume retention of that same 85th percentile runoff volume. And what's interesting and is really con confusing a lot of the other groups I work with is to see that 85th percentile both in the category for water quality as well as for the hydromod. And what this indicates is that developers, designers can do designs that kind of kill two birds with one stone. If you retain on site an 85th percentile event <coughs> and nothing's leaving the site, that means no pollutants are leaving the site and it means no water is leaving the site. So you're hitting your water quality requirement and you're hitting your flow control requirement. And I've, uh, the last three projects that I have reviewed between uh, consultants and municipalities for new redevelopment, they have put in um, water quality designs like bioswales that address water quality and they're calling it LID hydromod. And the water is just meant to filter through, drop out pollutants and then leave the site. Maybe you get a tiny bit of infiltration through the bioswale, but it's really a water quality design. And so you're, it's, an, it's a common mistake that I'm seeing people seeing bioswales or seeing pervious pavements that have under drains that maybe take all the water again off site, but they're thinking they're doing LID because it's got pervious pavement. So it's really important to understand the water quality requirements and how that might be different from the actual hydromod requirements and how you can leverage both together. So it's probably the most, again, the most common mistake that I see in looking at project plans um, is just having the water quality control. Uh, the other kind of hydromod, oh yeah. Yeah, it's usually the 85th percentile might will equate generally to a certain type of storm size. So I don't know what it is for Santa Barbara, the one-inch storm, the one inch storm the and the one-inch 24-hour, which may coincide also with a six-month, eight-month, nine-month rain event sort of thing that will generate a one-inch storm, which tends to be 85th percentile when you look at all the storms over the course of the year. 85% of that water is coming in in a given year in those small storms. So you want to you catch, if you can catch, the idea being scientifically, if you can catch all the small storms and deal with those, you're actually managing the majority of water that falls in any given year. And additionally, the small storms, again, carry, carry most of the pollutants. In, in stream and river systems, the, the shape that you generally see in a stream isn't, generally because of the big storms that come crashing through. It's the small storms, the repeated small storms that give most streams the physical look that it, that it carries. And when you get that bank on a stream, that bank is usually called the bank full um, event. And that's the event that tells you is that storm that banks over is the storm that gives it its most common shape. So they try to tie it the requirements to the science of either protecting a stream channel or how much a pollutant is carried. And really for design, it's going to be easier to design something that can address a lot of tiny storms that adds up to most of the water than trying to design a system that is going to address a giant storm. Uh, let's see, 5% EIA is also seen. That's 5% effective impervious area where the site has to function as if only 5% of it is impervious. And the city of Lompoc has this in place. And I believe the Ventura MPS permit is being contested because of this kind of requirement. It's very hard to meet. But it's another one of those regulatory requirements that seem to have picked up a bit of speed. And 
people kind of liked the sound of it, and so there are some requirements that say th something like 5% EIA. You figure it out. You do whatever you can, but only 5% of the site is, is allowed to act like impervious area and run off in that manner, pollutants or volume. And then sometimes you'll see in the HydroMod requirements, it will say uh, then LID were feasible. And I stuck this in there as a bit of an apple to the oranges because LID is just the tools that you use to try to achieve these other requirements. In and of itself, it is not a numeric requirement. With the way that lawsuits have been going, it tends to get put in with the regulatory language. Um, the best way to see LID is that to get to these types of numeric objectives, you want to try as your first line of assault using LID type measures that more mimic those natural processes. But it in and of itself is not really a numeric requirement. So these are just the different things that are floating around the state right now and nationally. And then you have your requirements set up based on your tiers. So to my understanding, really your tier three projects um, with your four, basically kind of residential 4,000 square feet of new replaced impervious surface, um, your, your different types with your commercial, et cetera, sends you down a flow path um, to bring you to actual numeric treatment requirements. So what you have in tier three is you have a water quality treatment requirement for retaining and treating the one inch 24 hour storm event. You have a peak runoff management to manage that 25 year peak up to the 25 year peak. And then you have a volume management that is um, something like trying to do a pre and post management of water, certain volume that's been, that would potentially be generated by the impervious surface. So in this, what's nice about yours is that you've got water quality, you're addressing your flood control through this, and you're getting the hydromod piece both through your peak runoff and through your volume reduction. And a smart developer will come in and say, what's the least amount of design that I can do to meet all those requirements? Can I design one facility or two facilities and hit that numeric target? There's not on that one. The, um, the, we did a study actually in Seattle looking at how municipalities set their peak management in a few different ways, some of them very non-scientific. Some of them, everybody else is managing 25-year peak, we'll, we'll pick up 25-year peak. So it's saying, it's saying here's the volume of a big peak, a big storm that would theoretically rip out your, your creek system. How much of that pre and post project volume can we actually detain on site? And it's usually detention, a detention type facility that's going to address that peak. So it's going to be a, a large volume. The other way that people do it is they look at what's your flood control service that you provide to your customers. We will protect you in the street and the infrastructure up to a 25 year storm. So we're going to manage peak volume of a storm up to the 25 year event. After the 25 year event, you may see flooding in the streets or you may see flooding on your property. Uh, it takes on a different objective when you start talking about the 25 year. The tiny, tiny storms, water quality, changes to channel, um, bigger peak events, flood control, and trying to at least tampen down, fully blowing out, um, let's say, a creek system. You've got three. You've got the 85th percentile um, in, your, in your treatment. And it says retain, which is really key. So it says water quality treatment requirement, retain and treat the one inch 24 hour storm. So, so you're retaining it. Where folks are having to modify, and you guys are already there, is that sometimes in the, it, what's called the attachment for general NPDES permit, it might say treat the, the one inch storm. And you can use those um, flow control or flow through type, like filtera units and, and things that just allow you to flow the water through, and the developer would be able to say, yeah, you know, we met the 85th percentile, or we treated the one inch storm, but by not retaining it, they're not doing any LAD aspect of it. So you've got retain in there, which is a really good thing to have in there. The other, so this is that, that type of issue. I, I pulled from the Filtera, and by the way, I really like Filtera units. They do, they do some nice water quality treatment 
Um, but just to give you an example of this concept, so the filtera units bring water from, let's say in this case it's a parking lot, and it you might get some treatment through some sort of filtration material that they have in it, but they're generally designed so that the water comes down into a um, slotted PVC or something like that and is moved over, is conveyed over to the, the traditional stormwater infrastructure. And then off-site, which may be, let's say, downstream, it's a creek or ocean. So you're getting nice, if it's designed properly, you're getting nice treatment, but the water is not staying on site. The water is all moving off site. Um, and so that would be an example of this is not LAD. <laughs> so this one is not LAD. Great water quality treatment, but it's got greenery associated with it, but it's not LAD. And so this is, uh, I pulled this from the Contech website. They had just a nice categorization of the different types of facilities that you might have. So treatment, just purely treatment, you get things like these filters. Um, you probably use stormwater management filters in this city, I'm guessing, the, the ones with the canisters that have compost in them sometimes, but they're, they're vaults with canisters. They're pretty, pretty commonly used. Water filters through composted material or some other type of material if you're trying to hit a particular pollutant of concern. Um, but it filters through and then it, it, it leaves, and it leaves the site. Same thing with these hydrodynamic systems like the centrifugal vortechnic units and things like that. They drop out big stuff. Um, but the again, the water leaves the site. Biofiltration, you start getting into a gray area. If this one was open at the bottom and the water was allowed to infiltrate, we could say, yeah, it's doing a little bit more hydro modification or LID. Um, so this starts getting into where you're pulling water in, perhaps it's filtering, but you've also somehow have it open the bottom so it can infiltrate through the system. Um, then your detention and infiltration type facilities, this is where you might get your classic vaults, um, things like that. They're just made to basically be detention and store a large volume of water. That might be how you're getting at peak storage, sometimes underneath parking surfaces. If it allows infiltration, you're getting some LID. Um, then some of the runoff reduction methods like rainwater harvesting. You're storing that water. You're keeping it from moving off the site. Theoretically, you're using it again. It's LID. And then porous pavers that do allow full infiltration, you're allowing for hydro modification to be managed. Uh, the this one. So usually there's a it's a storage. It's structurally it's got structural integrity for the the vehicles on top. Water comes in through um, an inlet or it comes in directly from the pervious surface itself, and it's made it's lined at the bottom so that it. Some of these are lined so it does not infiltrate and you're storing it like you would a, a vault, a regular detention vault, and then it would be released back into the stormwater system. In other cases, um, this is kept open to the substrate below to the native soil, and so it's storing and then it's slowly infiltrating back out. And you always have to have an overflow or something designed so that if that storage reaches capacity and it's not infiltrating quickly enough, the extra stormwater can can go off off the site or away from the feature. So, and I've got a, I got I have a couple pictures that we'll get to. Uh, yeah, I have a cross section layer that I'll show you. I mean, it, it's definitely by itself. It's got to have a subgrade with the right size aggregate and the right size structure around it. And if you're going to use it for storage, it needs additional structural integrity around it to, to hold that water in. So there are, there are a ton of different designs that give you different objectives. And this, I pulled this also from Contact. I kind of liked how they were putting some stuff together, but in thinking about communicating with the applicant and the strategy of how to meet those numeric requirements that you have in place, what's the kind of plan of attack they should be looking, looking at to leverage their money, the Sorry that this isn't, it seems it's a little bright in here still, but what this starts with are things that are talking about runoff reduction. So if LID is about managing the volume of water, you're going to start with things that are managing keeping the water from leaving the site, right? So anything that might do any sort of surface infiltration might be first on the list for them to be looking at. So pervious pavements that do allow kind of that subgrade infiltration or bioretention systems that allow infiltration. Um, 
these are the easier, greener, sort of cheaper. Then you might move into the example on the previous slide where um, it's got subsurface infiltration, so it's a bit more engineered. You're getting a bit of storage going with it, but you're still getting that water to infiltrate at the site and not leave the site. Rainwater harvesting, all these are about volume control on the site. Then if you've exhausted those possibilities, you start moving into some other things that um, maybe don't do as much in terms of volume control. So you've got the biofiltration that we had on the other page where maybe you get some, it's a vault underground, you get some infiltration, but it probably can't handle all the infiltration. Maybe there's a high groundwater table, maybe the soils aren't ideal, and the water, excess water, ends up going back into the regular stormwater system, stormwater infrastructure. And then these last two, as you're moving into detention, as you're moving down into treatment, then you're getting these filtration units like Filtera, um, stormwater filter devices, and then down into these cobble removers, which are the, you know, the, the, those big hydrodynamic systems don't do as well for water quality treatment as some of the types of devices that use filtering material. This pulls out big stuff, so it's not as good of a water quality treatment. So you're kind of moving down a line of attack in your design thinking of how you're going to deal with both water quality and volume management. And over here on the right, you're going to have some detention requirements and storage needs because you're also providing your community with flood control. So I thought this was a nice graph to sort of show that thinking and how one might work with the applicant to say, help them understand the types of BMPs that they might be want, wanting to look at. And then, the, and then using the actual LID design principles and avoiding those principles in the first place. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start whipping through these pretty quickly um, since we were going to try to stick to under an hour on this uh, PowerPoint. But avoiding the stormwater impacts in the first place. And this is back to folks tending to focus in on doing their design as, as they were going to do it and then coming back after the fact and trying to fit in the structural BMPs. In reality, if there's effort and ability to influence avoiding those stormwater impacts in the first place, then you don't have to put in as many structural BMPs. The site won't be so technically challenged, and again, it will be overall less costly to the developer. So the, the, these non-structural design elements don't get their fair share, I think, in the LID design process, and yet they're probably the most important. Um, I pulled out just a handful that would seem to be appropriate to this area, but there's, there's more. But minimizing clearing and grading, protecting and enhancing soils, minimizing impervious surface, and disconnecting impervious surface. You have more and less ability to do that here in Santa Barbara, depending on the site size. You can't do this full site assessment and site planning when you've got a, a tiny site. Um, but, you know, at somewhere there's a gray area where as the project site becomes larger, you're going to be able to use some of these techniques. The mass grading, uh, Crystal Cove, California, I believe they got in some trouble for the, the way that they graded the site, but you're all used to seeing kind of just going in and prepping the landscape for the buildings that need to go on. And, you know, that's, it's understandable. You need to have level sites. You need to be able to prep for parking lots and have level parking lots. Um, but it's very destructive, and it takes off all the good soils with it. So all those soils that would have given you that nice infiltration capacity, gone when you scrape. So now what we're seeing more, and we're seeing it actually in permit requirements, is to minimize that clearing and grading, being more selective about going in and putting in new development and getting in there and trying to really minimize disturbing any of the vegetation, any trees, and I don't know, you might have something like that already in place with maybe some of your landscape or tree protection type requirements, I would guess, for Santa Barbara. Would that be fair that you're pretty sensitive about going into new sites? Yeah, I think. I guess you, Santa Barbara, would be places like Carmel, Pacific Grove. They aren't knowingly saying this is LID, but they're doing it because they have other objectives in place. Um, this reminds me of the... Uh, in terms of cost, you know, it's a developer cost saying this, this costs us a lot of money to do this. And for those of you who are familiar with the spotted owl controversies, you know, back in the 80s when uh, there was the rulings that you couldn't go in and just clear cut, you know, old growth. You could go still selectively get it, 
and logging communities were saying, no way, this is, we, this is gonna cost too much, this is gonna put us out of business. But what they ended up doing was learning how to go in selectively with those helicopters and everything and pulling out the trees that they wanted. So it was, a, it was just a different way of doing business, still can be profitable, um, but a different approach that's gonna help the landscape. Enhancing the infiltration potential. Looking at the site, again, this might be um, for a larger type site, but you do get soils that change, as you've all seen, on any given site. You can have an area that's maybe more clay and an area that's more infiltrative. And working with the applicant, can, the, can you reserve, essentially, the better draining soils for where you might want to put your structural BMPs? You know, if there's not other constraints in the way, can you do that? On the right-hand side, we've got the soil amendments. We're starting to see nationally that soil amendments are starting to become requirements in NPS permits. So not only if the soil has been scraped, even if it's not been scraped, but they want to see um, an enhanced ability to infiltrate, there are starting to be requirements where they're um, putting in large-scale soil amendments because those soil amendments, especially for the bioretention systems, are the ultimate workhorse of how this water is managed, these small storms. It's the sponge. Um, and so even with clayey soils underneath, if you've got good bioretention soils, you can meet, oftentimes meet your numeric requirements. So there's been a lot of emphasis on soils and a lot of increasing emphasis on soils. Um, 18 to 24 has been average. Inches. Oh, I'm sorry, you were saying feet. Yeah, 18, yeah, whoo! <laughs> 18 to 24 inches for many of the bioretention systems. More if the circumstances, excuse me? Yeah, it is. Other technique is just minimizing the amount of impervious surface area that you're dealing with in the first place. Um, it was funny, I, I pulled this from a, a city in California in the last training that I gave was for city of San Luis Obispo and a guy said I know where that's it because I just I worked there <laughs> I just worked there two years ago I know where this is this is city of Elk Grove up by Sacramento at, for a while it was the fastest growing city it went I can't remember how many few hundred thousand people it grew in just a, maybe four years or something but the point of the slide besides all the impervious surface is uh, I wanted to ask you this slide's a little deceptive, but think about roadways, the, the right of way essentially, so sidewalks and streets. When you, when you look at an aerial view of any block, downtown, Santa Barbara, your, more your residential areas, what percentage of the impervious surface of the whole, like if you're looking down at the plan view of a neighborhood, do you think the street right of way makes up? It's closer to 70, 70% 70 is pretty consistent. This one, I need a different picture because they have their lot sizes really small here, but if you look at all the impervious, the rooftops, the whole bit, the street is, just because we have certain standards for city block lengths, it adds up to about 70, 60, 70% 70 of the impervious area. So I'm, I'm really big on dealing and doing things in streets because it's, also, so it's carrying most of the flow and it's carrying most of the pollutants, either pollutants that are coming from the adjacent properties or pollutants that are generated on the street because of vehicles or the street itself kind of decomposing. So streets, streets are a big deal. But it's really hard to reduce roadway widths because of our parking and our vehicles. Um, we narrowed road sections in Seattle and the residential neighborhoods. We also... Um, kept sidewalks to one side of the road in the residential neighborhoods as a technique to reduce impervious surface. It also gave us more room in residential areas for some of the, the bioretention swales and some of the other features that we wanted to put in. Uh, city of Santa Cruz has a, I don't wanna say it's a requirement, they allow a minimum of one sidewalk in their residential neighborhoods. And they never put it in as an, I don't, can't remember how many years it's been in place. It was never put in as an LID, reduce impervious surface technique. It was a cost reduction for the developer. We don't need sidewalks on each side and sleepy little streets. And so most developers up in that area are utilizing the one sidewalk. 
um, more, again, from the cost savings. Right. Yeah, I don't think you, most folks don't want something this lush. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't work in this Mediterranean climate um, either. It depends on where you're going to put the project and who's going to take the burden of that operations and maintenance of that facility. Because every new facility like this is another asset for the city infrastructure that needs to be managed, just like catch basins and everything else. Um, in some neighborhoods, you can put in um, agreements with the neighbors that, much like they do for um, planting strips in neighborhoods, much like they have planting strips in neighborhoods where it's where there is curb gutter sidewalk, and the city will say, well, we'll come in and maintain the trees, but you're responsible for kind of keeping the rest looking nice. And that's basically what happens in this example, that the residents are responsible for the kind of the aesthetic look. The city comes in and manages all the infrastructure and the trees. Um, but with something this involved and complex, it's really hard for people to keep this kind of look going. They do work parties in the summer, et cetera. What we're doing right now with my group is developing a plant list that is much more minimalist than any of the plant lists. I think it's even more minimalist than what you guys have in your manual because we figured that we just need plants we know are going to survive, are not invasive, are going to survive this climate, and they look pretty good and can hold their own against other invasives coming in and are going to require the least amount of maintenance. So, and it's got to work for the condition so of the, of the stormwater coming in. So it really decreases the size of the plant list. But generally, um, the kind of the infrastructure parts, the, s the city maintains on the, you know, in the public right of way, and residents or homeowners associations or something pick up the more aesthetic aspects. And it's, it's a problem. I I'll say it's a problem. Some of these streets that we did in Seattle, you could tell there would be the house where it all turned into dandelion. And part of us were like, well, geez, scientifically, maybe the dandelion's getting some good wa water filtering going on, but you know, it just didn't look good. I mean, it's just kind of the way that happens. So it's, it'll be an ongoing issue. Oh, the, the question was how to maintain, uh, the picture is showing a nice vegetated bioretention swale on the public right of way. And given all the vegetation and that's in there, how are, is that facility maintained? Uh, so the response was a, a combination between city, generally city crews, having to take up the responsibility, whether they do it in-house or they hire out crews or landscaping services for kind of bigger infrastructure like trees and overflow pipes and things like that, and residents taking on the um, operations and maintenance of the smaller plants and shrubs aesthetics. So the question was, do, do cities ever utilize stormwater that's been collected in any manner and convey it somewhere that it might be utilized? Yeah, yeah flood. We, I've not seen that. We started to look at the idea of that um, in Seattle where there were a lot of hills and not necessarily pumping it back up, but the thought was um, somebody had come out with a design that had, I don't remember the engineering term, but essentially a, like a conveyor, um, what I want to say, those things, um, mills that are attached that turn, somebody help me, I'm like on charades. Yeah, 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 that you could get in and if you could move some of that stormwater in down the pipe with some slope, you could move that wheel and generate some electricity. So they were using that, they were looking at an example of using the stormwater in that way, any excess, to actually help bring electricity to the uh, Seattle Zoo. But it was, it was very kind of highfalutin ideas of, of how to manage it. The other way is to minimize impervious surfaces like driveways. Um, shared driveways, this, even though the picture on the lower left shows a picture of a shared driveway in Sacramento, people on the West Coast, by and large, do not like shared driveways. Uh, you know, so your neighbor parks right in the middle, who owns it, if it cracks, all that sort of stuff. People on the East Coast, much more, I don't know how they figured out, but a lot more shared driveways on the East Coast. 
for California, what's going to work more are, th are the shorter driveways to reduce impervious surface rather than having a driveway that goes, that goes back. And sometimes that's consistent. Sometimes it's inconsistent with what a city might have as what they want the homes to look like, where they want the garages to look because of the aesthetics. Um, I heard one individual tell me from a city that, yeah, we love short, our developers love short driveways, not be necessarily because of the reduction of impervious surface, but they were saying, boy, today's society, people want to drive up into their driveway, the shortest distance, close their garage door and get into their house and not really have to walk around in their front yard and integrate at all with their neighbors. And I, you know, I've seen that, that, that's true. So the whole short driveway had a totally different purpose. Um, rather than any sort of stormwater management. But it's, so it's a common one that, that you'll see, a short, a short driveway. And permeable, obviously a permeable. I'm, I'm not huge on all the BM, structural BMPs that can be put on a residence because of changing hands of ownership and rain gardens getting filled in and this, that, and the other. But certain things like permeable driveways have a lot of longevity to them and they, and they work and they make sense. Um, clustering developments, I, I don't know how many opportunities you get here, but the, this is another one of the societal things where instead of everybody having a big yard and very little open space, the parcels are made smaller and more open space is preserved you know, for walking or trails or what have you. So, you're, so as a whole, as a snapshot of that whole land, there's more land that's functioning in a natural manner on the right-hand side than the left-hand side. Um, same comment, same group I was working with said, you know, that's, this idea has been so popular since the, I think it's the, the Davis Commons, if folks are familiar with that project. Davis Commons, it has a big common area in the middle, back behind the homes. There's always a waiting list to get into that area, but boy, heck, can't get that kind of development replicated in other parts of the state. And uh, what I'm hearing from people, planners, is they're saying, gee, it's because people don't really like to integrate work with their neighbors that, that much. People want their own piece of land with their own backyard, with their barbecue and their little garden. So the idea of clustering is, is a challenging one, but people seem to love it when they're actually in it. Disconnecting, easy. This is where you're create, you know, breaking out the energy. This is a parking garage, energy dissipator. It's disconnecting from the hard you know, keeping it from going into a pipe into a, a regular stormwater system, trying to keep that water on site. And you've got a little splash pad, and it goes to a rock pocket, and you're able to then infiltrate water. City of Portland, they were looking at their combined sewer overflow issues that they had, and I can't remember the million, hundreds of millions of dollars that they were going to have to do to go in and trench out and upgrade their big combined sewer systems where they have the sewer and the stormwater flows together and they were having overflows into the receiving waters and they were getting huge penalties from EPA and the state. So they, they did this study, they said, well, if we got enough people to disconnect their roof water from our system, could we cut back on the overflows? And they found that they could. So in Portland, if you go and you, g and you ask um, the city to come, say, I've disconnected my downspout, they'll come check it out, they'll see that you've disconnected it, got a little energy superior, and they'll give you a check for 50 bucks. And it's, that's, it's clean, that's it. And I think they've cut their combined sewer overflows by 70% or something just with that program. And then reducing the impact from impervious surface, you want to you direct flows from paved areas to stabilize vegetated areas. This is, you're probably familiar with seeing some of these uh, across your desk. Trying to keep it from leaving off site, <coughs> directing it to some stabilized vegetated areas where it can infiltrate. And you want to break it up, you know, across a site. So what it's maybe difficult to see here. Water from this parking lot is being directed into this stabilized vegetated area that will allow infiltration, but it's also happening over here and over here. So the grading for the parking lot is different. So going back to talking about early thoughts about how the <coughs> site's designed, the grading has to be different. It's got a grade to, to allow for the water to go into these inlets. Um, so it's a diff totally different way of looking at a parking lot design. So if you've gone through, hopefully, and done all these reduce impervious surface and disconnect um, surfaces, have you met your objectives? And in, in most cases, 
no, unfortunately. You may have gotten a long way, but you probably still have a little bit more work to do in order to, to meet the, the applicant, to meet the numeric requirements that they have. And so what they need to then do is start looking at those structural controls that people are familiar with. And I just want to go back to saying that, that site planning has to go with the structural BMPs for a successful design for cost. So here's a, a sort of a short list of the different types of BMP technologies. I've, you'll notice on the second and third bullet, I noted in parentheses that filter strips and kind of grass swales aren't really LID. They're really more water quality. I, I put them in the list because you will see them come across your desk, but you're going to know to kind of raise a red flag as to whether or not it's actually doing, the design is doing anything about the hydrology. It may be, you may be giving it an A plus for water quality, but just to be cautious of that. But bioretention, rain barrels, cisterns, green roofs, porous pavements, all do something significant if designed properly for the, the hydrology. And the two that you're probably going to see most are going to be the bioretention at the top and the porous pavement at the bottom. Are there, any, are there any other designs that you're seeing coming through sort of commonly outside of bioretention or pervious pavements? Those are, those are kind of the two, the two it. And again, the concept is about mimicking natural drainage, leveraging, there's the same picture. So one of the problems when people are, are updating their codes and ordinances to try to integrate LID is looking at where there may be conflicting codes or ordinances or where they can leverage. Um, here we've got a parking lot, so we need a driving surface for a vehicle, but they've also made it permeable paving. So they're getting two things. They're getting the surface for driving and they're getting a surface that's going to allow infiltration. And then they move the water over into this vegetated strip which meets their landscaping requirement but now does dual duty as being able to manage storm water. And um, I've come across several situations where you've got a willing developer to do something like this but the codes and ordinances hadn't been updated yet by the city that would allow, for example, stormwater to be managed in the landscaping strip and the developer was not able to do it because uh, the codes and ordinances weren't, weren't current with that kind of thinking. So multifunctional. Bioretention can take all these different types of looks. Here's um, the one on the upper left, more for a, a denser city where you need the parking on the street and you know, it, you're more in a commercial area, so you get water coming in off the street and going through a planter. It's called a planter box. Ideally, you'd like to have these open at the bottom to infiltrate, but they can be lined at the bottom so that you're holding the water. You're still doing some hydromod by holding the water, but it can only handle so much, and, and it ends up discharging back out onto the street as it would have been flowing down beforehand. It's also taking in water from the sidewalk. Here's the more kind of naturalistic rain garden, sort of a depression that's just picking up water um, from a, a house or maybe from a street that's coming in. Here's looking at sort of an engineer, more engineered look at a bioretention system, just to kind of look at the anatomy of it. Um, here's one where you're digging down, excavating, putting in a, uh, an aggregate layer. This one's going to have a s uh, perforated pipe so that excess water can actually move into the more conventional stormwater system. Some now have geotextile fabrics. Some people are getting away more and more from not using these. They're not finding weeds growing up. They're trying to get more infiltration. Substrate layer, then your soils are 18 to 24 inches, and then your vegetation that's going to work in this type of system. The geotextile fabric had been, um, the question was explaining more about the geotextile fabric. And it had been put in originally when people were afraid that weeds were going to be growing up through the bioretention system, so that they were going to get plants or trees or things coming in that they thought would actually be destructive to the structural integrity of the design. And they're finding that that's not really happening. And sometimes these liners would be made um, impervious if you actually did not want the water to infiltrate. So for example, maybe you have groundwater contamination or contaminated soils, so you'd like to use the techniques that a bioretention system brings, but you really don't want the water 
going through the contaminated soils and then further contaminating groundwater. And so I see the liners being used more for that ladder, you know, being cautious about potential contamination, and less so now trying to keep weeds or undesirable vegetation growing into the system. And then bioretention swale, and I'm, I'm, I put the little astrophe there to indicate that swale sometimes indicates to people more just these water quality where the water's just moving along the surface. But this is a bioretention swale where it's doing both. The water is coming in. It's a curb bulb extension. They're generally done as retrofits. Um, I like these quite a bit because they're cheap and they're effective. And if you can spare a parking spot or two, uh, you can get them in there. But uh, yeah, I know. It depends on where I'm saying that in which, which city. Um, residential neighbors. But it's where you can go where you've got an existing curb gutter sidewalk. And so you can't do a complete new green street or, you know, sort of swale system. You've got to work with what you have. So the water comes down as it would down um, the curb, enters into the bioretention swale. And same kind of design as that anatomy picture that I was showing you just the slide before. You've got all these amended soils. In this case, water that um, overtops will just overflow back onto the street as it normally would have flown, uh, uh, moved down the system. So you get treatment through the vegetation, you get infiltration. Uh, you can see that there's a little bit of a weir built up here, so it holds some of that water back. Uh, people really like these. The treatment efficiencies are really good. It is back to maintenance. It's another infrastructure. There's sometimes trash that collects there. They're, you know, they, they require maintenance, and you have to calculate, if I just do one, is it going to do something? Do I need several of these down a length of a street to really kind of get some oomph for managing the, the pollutants and the amount of water. Um, again, Portland that's been doing LID now for f coming up on 20 years, they have a program that puts a lot of these in. A lot of cities are starting to put this type of design in. Yeah. You mean like the ex like some not exactly like this, but yeah, like an exickling, but more the. Pl are you talking about the planting strip that's usually in the yeah, in the sidewalk? You can. Um, <coughs> the question was whether or not uh, instead of having a curb bulb extension that extends into the street and takes up precious parking, can the water be directed from the street off into the landscaped yeah, area? And it's and it's it is a grading, and we we. You're absolutely right. You you can do those. Sometimes the grading isn't as simple. De it depends on where you're at. And it depends on how much infrastructure you might have right at that spot. Yeah, but, uh, but, it, but it is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an area of potential for that same type of concept design. Yeah. Um, the You, you could. I, th I think it is, um, as brought up in the back, it's looking at what kind of engineering constraints might you have or, or none. Is it, is it pretty simple to do to get that water in, get that water out, um, deal with sort of existing trees, um, especially if your alternative of doing the cur curb bulb is not really an attractive alternative because you'd be losing parking. The For the examples that I was giving, the curb bulb at 5000 bucks a pop is so much ish is so much cheaper than going the other route. But if you're constrained from a curb bulb, the type of approach or at least evaluating that might work. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It does, and as we did one like that in Seattle, and it does just become that engineering um, on paper makes sense when you're actually trying to get the grades and the slopes of the pipes moving down the street so that you, you can connect to the existing infrastructure. It's just got it's just got to match up, but it's feasible. Mm-hmm. Yep, and some, if you look at the city of LA, um, they have new street specifications that just came out a couple months ago, and they're looking at things just like that. So there's lots of different manifestations on how this can be done. Certainly certainly don't have the, uh, the time here to show all of them, but the, the creative thinking of where you've got constraints, well, where else can you put that design, and will it fit with your existing infrastructure? Absolutely. Just real quickly, Darla, to interject, we are taping this today, so staff who miss it have the opportunity to watch it. We're getting away kind of from finishing the presentation to going into questions, which is fine. This is completely informal and and freeform. So just to reiterate what we were discussing here, we're talking about the opportunity that parkways Mm -hmm. and existing vegetation and areas present for possible LID and stormwater management. It's a really good point. Uh, We've talked about it in the past with some other staff, and Darla's talking about the fact that yes, it does present a good opportunity. I think my question to just um, dovetail on it is about the vegetation in the parkway, how, how, or in these kind of designs, how important different types of vegetation are for the retention and treatment versus just a parkway that may just be um, grass or very limited vegetation. Mm -hmm. I think you still get a lot of the same benefits You get many of the same benefits. It depends. You know, the grass systems lawn does not provide a lot of infiltration potential. It's kind of that green asphalt sort of terminology. But you can get some good filtering through grass. I mean, there's just been decades of studies on filtering through grass. If you're looking for water quality treatment, you you can do a grass system. The way that our bioretention systems are going to look different in California than some of these pictures from Seattle, for example, is that the soils and the vegetation in places like Portland and Seattle are, are both kind of the workhorse. They, they, they do a lot. They, you know, they pull up nutrients. Uh, they, they pull up metals, some of the plants. Um, they pull up water, obviously. They evapotranspirate. Our plant regime in this climate is very different. We basically need plants that are just going to survive and look good they're not going to be doing the kind of filtering and pollutant management that you might get if we lived someplace that was wetter and more lush. In our region, it's going to be the soils that is going to be the workhorse of these designs. And I'm working with some folk right now and had been asking Autumn about where the soil specifications came from that are in this manual um, because right now there's not a consistent soil spec for bioretention in this state. And certainly you can put in soils that will be very healthy for the plants, but they're the not the best soils for managing the stormwater, you know, making good infiltration, n- not the right inorganic um, organic composition. Um, so what I've been seeing is a lot of good plant-type soils are compost mixed in with native soils, and they're, they don't really meet the specifications for the bioretention system. And then basically what you've got is sort of a depressed area or a planter or any sort of system that's probably not functioning very well. It's not functioning to what it's designed to be functioned. So the plants are going to be kind of take a bit of a second seat. They need, they need to be established. They need to look good, work well, not be invasive. But it's the soil that's going to be the most important thing in our bioretention designs here. You mentioned grass being the green, green pavement. Is that because it's associated with foot traffic that compacts it down, or is there something to do with the root matting of grass that makes it like that? So it's the root matting of the grass that generally limits or decreases the amount of infiltration that you can get. So if you, um, you know, particular types of species of grass, if you walk on a really rainy day and you can go, go, go up and like look in there, you can see the water on the surface and it's moving over the surface. It's having a really hard time infiltrating. And in some states, you have a flow chart right now, for example, that says if you have a project that has X amount of new and replaced impervious surface, you're going to have to do stormwater controls. In some states, the flow chart may say 
Also, if you're going to be changing um, a certain size of area from native vegetation to grass, you also have to do the stormwater requirements because there's a recognition that it's sort of like an impervious surface to some degree. And it, it's the root mass in general. Yes, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. I didn't. So oftentimes the, those um, pipes um, in a lot of these, the PVC pipe will be perforated so that you are trying to maximize some level of infiltr infiltration and letting that water out of the pipe. It's got to get into the pipe too for the excess to go out. But you're trying, you're still trying to allow the system to function in a in a way like natural conditions. So you don't want to seal up that system. Thanks. I haven't. Yeah, the question was, um, have I seen any of the type of uh, structural BMPs that st store water but allow the infiltration to come out the sides, um, sort of like some of the slides I was showing earlier? In yeah, and and, in, and you're asking in particular around the street right of way. I haven't seen those types of designs in the confined areas like a street right of way. I have seen it for larger. Um, like if somebody's putting in a, a new subdivision and they've got a lot of land to play with, usually they're going to go do a detention pond because that's cheaper. For, for some reason, if they cannot do a detention pond, <coughs> they may end up doing a vault that is open bottomed or allows something so that it's trying to seep out and allow infiltration. But I haven't seen it in the street. doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen it. I don't know what your, per there's, you know, wet, there's wet, dry detention ponds, and I don't know what your requirements are here for your kind of depth of water and how long you can keep that water there. There may be vector control for mosquitoes for length of time of standing water, but I don't know about your, your design for your detention ponds. Yeah. So you said that the soils is the workhorse here, but so much of our soil is this crappy clay soil that you can't, um, that doesn't infiltrate. So what do we do about that? Ah, so good. I like that question because it gets into one of the misconceptions. So the, so imagine the, this, like for example, this system here as an engineered piece of infrastructure. So the design and its performance is based on, on this actual design. And so, as well as understanding how much infiltration you're going to be able to get into the into the native native soil, so you've got to put the two pieces together of understanding. In a system where, let's say, there's really clay soils, uh, yeah, you certainly may be limited in getting that water to move from this system down into the into the native soil. But the soil that's there, that Biome retention mix does an amazing amount of work in being able to hold the water like a sponge. When we did our projects in Seattle, some of that more lush one that I was showing earlier, we designed those cells, much like these cells, uh, to manage the two-year storm event. And we waited three or four years before we, we – it kept raining and there was never any, th we had monitoring stations down the block and we kept waiting for water to come down that, that it couldn't hold. And it ended up that those systems managed the 100 year event purely by the soils in these cells. The underlying soils had a lot of clay and that's why we didn't think we were gonna be able to manage them very well. We hugely underestimated the storage and volume and slowing down that happens in these bioretention soils. And there's not a lot of modeling that's been done on it, and there's a huge cry for we need more modeling on that so that, that people can design these appropriately. So when people say, well, it can't be done in clays, um, you know, clay does give some level of infiltration capacity, obviously not like sand. You get some, but when you couple that with a well-designed bioretention system where a lot of the work is actually being done there, for the small storm events, then we, you really can meet a lot of these numeric requirements. So it sounds like what you're saying is in order for it to work, you have to dig a big hole, get rid of your clay soil, and put in some good soil that will, that will work. 
Well, so, you dig down. You dig down. So th you you don't need to dig it out completely, but you dig out to the specifications, like that 18 to 24 right. inches, and how much you want to. What what storm are you trying to manage? But you don't need to. Um, you want that soil and that depth to be in there to the degree that it's actually going to be able to function, not necessarily take the place of your native soils, your clays. The other thing with the clay soils that's a bit of a misnomer is that if the requirement says that you need to function more like the natural conditions, a site that's on clay is not going to be required to function and meet the same requirements as a system that's on sand because naturally a site that was made with, you know, had a lot of clay didn't hold as much water in the first place. So mimicking a site with clay, you know, they're not going to be, the developer will not be held to the same standard because of the soil condition. Their pre and post development calculation will look different than for somebody who's on sand. Um, but that said, yeah, these, these systems, you know, they're infrastructure, they're engineered to be doing a lot of that work for on that water. Yeah. First of them. Do you have any experience working with LID projects in a floodplain where uh, retention isn't a problem, but infiltration is? It just it ponds rather than infiltrates. I do not, but I will. Um, well, you can you stay tuned. The city of Paso Robles got a Strategic Growth Council Urban Greening Grant to put in a complete street or green street uh, by the fairgrounds, and the street runs. Um, basically from their old town, area of town, down toward the Salinas River. And as we get closer to the Salinas River, we've got, it's a floodplain. Well, the whole project area is in a floodplain, but the groundwater table is higher as we get closer to the river. And some of the designs that we're looking at for retention and how to deal with the flow is taking that into consideration. Can't, can't infiltrate a lot of it because the groundwater table is so high, so we're going to be holding more of it, slowing it, and, and trying to disperse small amounts off in different places rather than trying to infiltrate a lot of water in one location. So that very dispersed concept of LID, so you have a better chance of actually getting it in. And in some cases, when you get far down where the groundwater is really high, that those bioretention systems won't be appropriate. It's, you know, the groundwater table is too high. So. So if the groundwater is like, uh, if the groundwater table is like low, you can uh, you can make like a vertical tank instead of a horizontal tank, and that way you can get it like down below, and it can uh, and it can get out the bottom of the tank. Like like say if you had like a a place on your property where it's like uh, you know it's pretty much all concrete, yeah. but yet you got this area where you can put it underneath and, and collect the water and take it to a vertical tank, mm -hmm. which is much smaller in diameter, but mm -hmm. really a lot deeper. Yes, you can. So any, any storage tanks that allow, that just don't keep all the water and push it into the conventional stormwater system, allow any manner to allow that water to in, you know, release from the bottom or the size or however, whatever shape that is, Lay it flat, lay it straight down. It's like a, it's, it's an underground storage tank, essentially, but for water, for good water that you're going to, and then that can seep out for your maybe less um, infiltrative soils. That can seep out. It, can, it has more time to sort of seep out more slowly. So it's, it's an underground detention. Darla, how are we doing on the slides as far as getting I through your presentation before we? Yeah, I was going to ask you. I think we're getting, uh, we're getting close. And okay. I'll well, this is good. I like the, the okay. questions that are coming up. They're, this was the 45-minute discussion or uh -huh. presentation that's moving on. So, so let's flip through the slides and then we'll we can keep through. doing the good questions. Another example of bioretention planner, um, this, is a, this is a retrofit example. So a uh, parking lot where they just went in and cut out a strip where they knew. It's a little bit of an optical illusion, but the water is actually pointed in toward the, the planting strip area. And this one is a planter box type. So it is lined, it's got the concrete at the bottom. I don't remember why they didn't want it to actually infiltrate if it was soils or groundwater, but it's basically a planter box, concrete on all sides except the top. The hydromod that it does is that it's holding the water that, that goes in. It's getting some treatment through the soils. Whatever the soils cannot hold, it goes back off the site or into the conventional infrastructure. 
different examples. I just want to show you different examples, some of the bioretention systems that have more of that Mediterranean look to it. And I want to show you here. Here's a, com here's a common, just if you ever run into this, common mistake that happens. So this overflow for this bioretention swale is purposely elevated so because we want to hold um, the certain size small storm event into the system, allow it to infiltrate. And at a certain size storm event, it's going to overflow and go back into the infrastructure or into this uh, conventional stormwater infrastructure. And I've heard, I think, three cases now here in California where when the folks are actually doing the construction get out there and they, and they see this, they're like, that must be a mistake. How's the water going to get out? This thing is supposed to be designed flush to the, to the system. That must be an error. And so they end up going in and designing it flush. And then none of the water is being held in the bioretention system, and they have to go back and fix it. So just, just a common mistake in case it comes across your desk. Some different designs. Inline and offline, you know, inline systems, much like some of the questions that are being asked. Water comes from the uh, parking lot. It's held, kind of stored with vegetation and rock, but it overflows into the existing conventional stormwater system. Sometimes this does not take a lot of space. Offline is where we were talking about earlier. It comes in off from the street and then goes back out onto the street. So offline, it doesn't, it's not really connected to the, the hard stormwater infrastructure. And then cisterns. Uh, I'm all for cisterns. There's a, lo a lot of complexity right now about how they're treated in terms of pollutants and how to maintain them. And a lot of cities here in the state are trying to come up with standards, plumbing code standards and things like that for using them. I see them mainly used on large commercial buildings to uh, deal with their HVAC, so their heating and cooling, and to some degree potable, um, yeah, I mean, uh, non-potable uses such as uh, toilet flushing, stuff like that. But big... Barrels are wonderful from an education standpoint. Cisterns, though, is where you really start making a dent um, in the water, the volume of water that's managed. I had somebody up in Pacific Grove tell me that it, on a really foggy day, her rain barrel fills up. So, you know, rain barrels don't quite do it. Permeable paving, all sorts of different types, interconnecting, modular, concrete there on the right. Seven, eight years ago, they failed a lot, and it, there weren't very many contractors that knew how to place them. They just weren't good. I didn't recommend them, and they've really, the industry's turned around, and most of them are pretty dang good now um, and do a great job at infiltrating and pollutant removal and volume control. So here's a few examples. A pathway of uh, pervious concrete in Santa Monica. The right, uh, the parking lot on the right is kind of a common example where to meet the stormwater objectives, they didn't need to put the permeable pavements on the whole site, and they decided not to put it in the driving lane where there's a lot of um, structure, and instead they put it in the parking parking area. Then lower illustration just shows a cross section where you've got the pervious concrete at the top, but you do have to have this structural layer aggregate material engineered to be able to handle the weight of vehicles. Sometimes um, previous pavements are used on little maintenance roads, so fairly heavy trucks going through, not really frequently, but infrequently. Porous asphalt on the lower left. So you put in all your structural BMPs, you cross your fingers, go back. Did you, did you meet your numeric, did the applicant meet your numeric requirements? You hope so. If not, it's sort of a, an iterative process. And that's the last slide, and I was ending with my question to you. I saw that in your BMP manual, you have the DART SWIMP checklist, the Development Application Review Team checklist, where you are asking the applicant a lot of questions about how they're going to look at the site, how they're going to integrate low impact development into the site. I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to use that checklist very much, and if you have, how has it gone? Or is it still kind of in a beta testing mode? There's a few of you in here who, who I know use it with their projects. Who wants to speak up? This is your chance. Here, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. When it first came out a few years ago, um, nobody knew what to do with it. And then in engineering, we decided to just start going through it ourselves and, and filling in what we could. 
I don't know that it's ever been given to the applicant, but it makes more sense to me to give it to them as a planning tool and then we can look at it and see if it's reasonable. Ah, okay, I read it as something you gave to the applicant, like a due diligence, like are you going to do this? Yeah, it's sort of a staff planning tool more so. That's how it was originally developed, is to be for internally planners and staff to use it okay. in order to make sure that their projects that, that we're managing our applicants uh, correctly and directing them in the right way of how to, how to you know achieve the stormwater management requirements. So the applicants don't see it as much as the internal staff. And has it been helpful then in when you come back and see? Not yet, okay. okay. What about you? Have you used it a lot on different projects? It's a work in progress, it sounds like. It's a work like. in progress. And, and one of the reasons it caught my eye is that uh, some of the discussions with other groups and the regulator is that what seems to be lacking is a couple things. One is um, the applicant somewhere documenting their due diligence of how they went through these steps or your steps. You know, how, did, how hard did they try and, and show their work sort of thing. And, and you even have a requirement in here, I believe, for your structural BMPs. If they say we can't do it, you make them show you why not in a, in a very much more intensive way than anybody else, I think, in the state. Um, you know, show us why you can't do it. Um, but one thing that's missing is an ability to document in a really easy location what some people call the performance warranty for the BMPs that would come back and say, this project was designed to manage the 25-year um, peak and the 85th percentile or one-inch storm event. And what did you put in place? What designs did you put in place? And you know, are you're, you're basically asking for a warranty that the design is going to function appropriately if designed to the specifications on the plan. But what people also do is then say, what's the pollutant load removal? Like, what are you getting for it? What pollutant load reduction or how much water is getting managed? Because ultimately, over time, you want to take all of those and inventory them together and say, okay, over the course of a year of projects, how much pollutant load reduction are you reducing from going into the ocean or into the creeks? Or you want to be able to go out um, back and inspect some of these sites and say, well, we say it was, uh, looks like it was designed to do this, and it doesn't seem to be maintained like it should be, so therefore it's not functioning, and so we need to up the maintenance. So I was really intrigued by the, that sheet as a way to get the applicant to understand what they might need to look at, but also to document that they said they were going to do it. Um, so, so work in progress, but I think it's it's an important piece that needs to get in there. Maybe maybe thinking about how it might be modified um, would be useful as part of your internal discussions. But yeah, I think that was the intent originally. It was more that was developed over six years ago, and as staff turnover has happened, it's always a re it's a reiteration process and effort that we have to do with, you know, reminding staff that this is something that is a, it's a really useful tool to yeah. get the stormwater requirements implemented into each project. So tell me more about, um, I, here's one thing that I'm, so I'm this objective entity, right? I don't work for the water board. I'm, I'm not a municipality. I'm not an environmental group. So I'm in this great position where I, I, I hear all the, all the stuff from all of you. So one of the things I hear about um, your requirements is You've got uh, the hydromod requirements down at 4,000 square feet of new and replaced impervious surface, a pretty, a pretty small size. For most municipalities that I've worked with, uh, I was saying this to Autumn and Cameron, water quality requirements are generally triggered at something around that size, but you can use those flow throughs. You don't have to try to keep the water on site. You can use a flow through, treat the water, water goes off the site. And it's not until you get to a slightly larger site, maybe 10,000 square feet, new and replaced impervious surface, is often the applicant required to do the volume, you know, the hydromod control. The argument I've heard is that it's technically unfeasible to manage the quantity of water, uh, try to keep it on site at a 4,000 square foot threshold. So I am curious to ask all of you, have you worked on projects that small? And have you required the volume control? And have you been successful at it? And, and why or 
what were the challenges? Start at Victoria. I've had a couple projects where there was just, they had to retain, and what they ended up doing was engineering underground tanks to then discharge at a 25-year event. So it'll, it'll actually hold the water on site, and then they can discharge it. And, and actually, we have a project coming in now that they're putting in a green roof, and they're going to be capturing water on site and actually watering some of their landscape on site. So it's possible. It's it's you know mm -hmm. it just has to be engineered when you have smaller lot sizes, and you ha the only place really you can do it is underground. So. Mm -hmm. And I've heard orifice sizing is sometimes an issue with that. Maybe that's I don't know. Was there was there engineer? I can't remember if there are engineers in the room. But the orifice sizing sometimes for small sites makes it really difficult to get a release rate that you know lets you move that water off the site because you can always store much so much in your storage uh, tanks and but yet you don't want it ripping out of the system so I was kind of curious so that so that works with underground for you other are there other examples of that small site can anyone think of any on hand it's part of today was to bring in your plans I don't see anyone with a lot of plans, <laughs> plans. to make this useful did anyone bring in anything that you wanted to uh, talk about that plans that uh, I brought in one or two backup because I kind of thought this might happen but it's a really good opportunity to yeah. use Darla's experience and background in how we deal with the challenges, you know, with the sites that are completely built out, lot line to lot line, which is a really common scenario in Santa Barbara, and how we're able to actually meet our numeric criteria, which is, you know, quite complicated. Is anyone in here, has anyone worked on the, at any one point, I know the staff turnover has been quite large on this project, but the 535 East Montecito Street, Portales, <coughs> is that how you say everyone says it? Portales, am I saying it right? I brought the plan sheet, and if I'm not cutting you short, Darla, yeah, no. I thought maybe, it, I know it was a, it, it is a challenging project to implement stormwater because it has very high groundwater, it's in the lower east side of town, and it's, a, it's an extensive hardscape project. There's a lot of build out. Tim was reminding me about how we were scratching our heads on how to actually implement the stormwater requirements when we yeah. initially saw it two or three years ago. Sounds good. 522 Garden. Here, talk, t talk a little bit about that one, what you have in mind. Well, no, I was just going to suggest, I think I still have a copy of their plans, but it's a pretty small site. It's maybe 5,000 square feet. It's mixed use. All of it's um, paved. And, and, put and I just want to take a look at that because I'm really not sure if it's meeting. I think it has underground storage, but mm -hmm. and it's contaminated soil underneath it. So those are the kind of issues. You have a lot of contaminated soil downtown, right? From right. dry cleaners and gas stations over, over time. So, so I'll go grab that. Yeah. So for those who are still here, off off the top of your heads, what are what are you finding? Are your whether it's regulatory or technical? What are like your two or three top, um, I guess, constraints in implementing all this LID stuff? Um, Hillside is the big. Hillside. Um, we generally, you know, most of the literature I see says to not put in LID at you know, certain slopes, like 20% slopes. I'm not sure what kind of slopes you guys are talking about for this. Um, what are you, what's your st what's your steep slope ordinance? Is it 20? Yeah. So what would happen in some cities where they don't want to put the LID on the steep slopes, they do alternative compliance where the developer pays money to mitigate the stormwater impact somewhere else downstream and not have to do it there at the, at the steep slope location because of some concerns. Um, sometimes they've said you just can't do infiltrative practices, but you can do like cisterns or techniques if that works. So just something that might not create more slope stability issues. You know, cisterns, pervious pavements even can provide potentially some um, undesirable water into those areas. But anything that might store it rather than infiltrating it. 
and then that becomes very constraining on, on then the applicant being able to meet the numeric requirement because infiltration is the one everybody tries to go for. So you so you either allow an alternative compliance or you try to go for something like a you know cistern storage tank. What else is really hard about this doing this? Well, especially on the small lots, it's super expensive to do some of this stuff underground. You know these tanks and cisterns and stuff. It seems like um, it's hard to ask people who are doing a little like addition to their house and having five or six hundred square feet of new impervious surface to like put an all new permeable driveway or whatever. You know, I mean, it's it can be expensive. I hate I hate having to tell people that they have to do that. Is it a pretty um, compar uh, small compared to the? Is it proportion to the cost of their project before you allow an ex exemption or an exception? Just move that. You can't what? In, unless it's infeasible, you don't right, allow exemptions. Right. Unless they, I, my understanding is, unless they prove it's infeasible, mm -hmm. all the all the different methods are infeasible, then they have to do it. Okay. So you don't have a cost infeasibility built into your element. Okay. Yeah, that would be hard. <laughs> really hard to tell people that. Um, what else is really tough? Are we going to have an LID sheet separate from the BMP sheet because as building inspectors we're required to catch it all at the end? So it's like sometimes like really hard because we don't have a lot of time to do our inspections because we have so much. So I was, I was just wondering is there going to be a requirement like say the landscape architect we have them land, uh, sign off on all the, you know, plants because we don't know what they all are. Are they going to be signing off on the lid? Um, like I've got some, an, another thing is that I've got Rogers tract up on the Mesa and it's huge and it's really steep and there's really no lid on that right now. It's all BMPs and they just got done redoing the BMPs and it was like, $48,000 worth of plastic and sandbags again. So now all that plastic is just creating like no lid. It's just hitting the plastic and going down the storm drain. Yeah, yeah, construction. So are, is lid, are we going to try to include lid in with the construction site BMPs at I the beginning of the job or? I, I, I Victoria's talking about that there are some retention basins there that are meant to capture a lot of the runoff and hold and or infiltrate. I don't know if they're lined or not, but I think the really important point to make here is that there's a big difference between actual construction when you're grading and dealing with the site and managing it during the rains versus post-construction, how the site is actually designed to look when it's all finished and built out. And what Darla is talking about mostly today is how we're managing stormwater on the site once it's built out and completely designed. And so this is post-construction stormwater management or post-construction LID. So um, construction's a little different. It, it obviously deals with hydrology and stormwater in the same respect, but we're talking about how we design projects for the end result. Yeah, that's why I thought it's actually completely Right, when you have to go and sign off as a building inspector. Yeah. It's a really good point. And I, uh, we've been talking about this a little bit. It's something that's obviously been red flagged on a big need for the city, which is if we're um, actually get to see the end of a project, which doesn't happen um, all that often where it's built out, you get to go and, and call it done, the building inspector needs to be able to check off, yes, they met their post-construction BMPs, they were implemented as spec'd on the sheets, making that a really more simplified, clear process on how that's done, how it's on the sheets so when you're out there in the field at the project site, it's confirmed. It's just yeah, another different practices, so it's a good one. Another thing to tackle. Good questions, Andrew. Um, I work at the airport and I have two very common uh, 
constraints for implementation. And uh, one is the uh, FAA advisory circular that discourages detention basins because of the bird strike hazard that they present. And the other is that we're, you know, basically on filled slough for most of the uh, of the site, and we have an incredibly high water table, and we're in the floodplain. And so, again, con you know, conveyance is preferred over over uh, detention, and infiltration just doesn't occur at that low elevation. So those seem to be the two. I mean, you know, the one thing that we can do easily is retain on site because everything's coming there anyway. But that's discouraged by uh, federal regulation. I asked the airport question. I said somebody wasn't going to ask the airport question. Because of, <laughs> because of all those different requirements, it does make implementing LID incredibly challenging. Um, yeah, the waterfowl, birds coming in, um, this, you know, safety about, uh, the, I mean, the water issue in general is just big there. Um, I was in, I flew into Fort Worth a couple years back, and they actually had, Bioswale is going around um, where they put in a lot. They really highly amended the soil, and they had bioswales going around that picked up some of the water coming off from the runways because they want to keep the runways free. Large scale, the, you know, the type where you're doing huge peak management, they weren't able to achieve that. I, I was asking somebody about it. So sometimes, depending on the site, if you've got if you've got that ability to get around there. Again, going back to the soil, assuming that you're not going to really be able to count much on the um, underlying soil because of the groundwater table or the groundwater level, you can go in and try to design something that's just purely going to function from that system, and it's only going to hold pretty small rain events. So that's why I was asking about exceptions like, you know, gee, we can get the two-year storm managed for water quality and flow, but we can't do the peak because our conditions aren't going to allow that. So it might be a modification. I don't know if you allow modifications to the requirements. Do as, do as much as you can and have to show basically why federal law or otherwise you cannot do the rest. Yeah, that's just so it. You have an exception. Oh, it was a trick question. You have an exception for airfield <laughs> operations. <laughs> but, but they do, but I do see. Airfield operations, there's a lot more going on there than just aviation. Yeah. We have tenants, we have roadworks, just, you know, mm -hmm. anything else that you might find in a light industrial area. <coughs> but the same restraints apply. Um, and our, our exemption specific in, in the slump pertains to airfield operations, taxiways, runways, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it becomes, a t uh, it becomes a difficulty of being able to meet uh, the rate in conversations with the regulators. They say, well, this is the bar that we want you to meet. And you've got your bar or in your manual or numeric bar. And when you do maximum extent practicable, cost included, and you come below that bar, then what happens? You say, okay, you did, you did good, so put that in place and we'll call it good. Unfortunately, with that kind of model over time, cumulatively the environment suffers because you're always coming under the mark. And I haven't seen a plan yet from a watershed perspective or otherwise to kind of take up that slack for where we're running short. You know, we can put in a few techniques, but we can't do them all for whatever reasons. And um, so usually what I've seen is people, Southern California, folks saying, okay, this is as good as you can do. We'll, we'll call it good for this. M we're going to call it MEP, even though you didn't meet the numeric target. I would thought that would Yeah, the common is green roofs potentially as a yeah. solution for yeah. airport restraints. And they're back to cisterns again. The H, the whole HVAC thing with cisterns. Shall we talk about Los Portales? Does any? I we've got Danny in here and Allison. You worked on it. I don't know if Dan or Peter, if you guys did. Um, it was Kathy. Anyways, the basic constraints that I know about this project was uh, th there's a very high groundwater table kind of in the lower east end of our city, Darla, and a lot of the projects down there that. A lot of our infill projects, especially in the lower industrial area there where there's some vacant lots that are occasionally being developed, uh, they run into that issue. Um, I don't know if this one had contamination, I don't recall. But um, it's a very built out project. It's, it's a two plan sheet actual project and, and what you see in the kind of the shaded area 
is walkways and some permeable cobble uh, paving that they had proposed, but all of the um, white areas with the with the writing in it is building. And if I flipped the page, um, the building is even more extensive. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity for infiltration because the only the permeable uh, walkways, you know, only have a limited amount of capacity, um, both tr for treatment and retention. Um, Anyway, if those were the main challenges. Can anyone add to what I'm saying? Right, it was a, yeah, it was kind of a, it was a vacant lot, but it was very um, degraded. I thought there was part asphalt and then a lot of just kind of bare scrape. Yeah. Anyway, so I just kind of want, I liked the point that you initially made on how, you know, spreading out more shallow LID concepts and this kind of kind of design is really one of your only options other than going underground, but then the high groundwater sort of negates that option. I don't know, just thoughts. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask all of you back out, what other options do you think there could be or could have been for this site <coughs> that caught maybe from least cost up the up the chain. So they really didn't have much choice. They ended up raising the site, they, you know, because it was like it, it just floods down there all the time. So they, in this particular area of town, there really wasn't anything they could do. I think as far as putting like cisterns on the surface, our ABR probably wouldn't like those. Mm -hmm. And so at least with the underground tanks, you don't see them, you can you know, plant over them, you can discharge at a certain rate. But I really <coughs> don't see that they had any other option than to do what they did, which was A, actually, they were gonna have underground storage tanks, they raised the site, and now they're um, actually gonna connect to the city storm drain. Yeah, it was right there. So Cameron just mentioned, and, and it's one that's used sometimes in uh, sites that are lot line to lot line and like a little bit commercial is, is are the planter boxes. And I didn't have any pictures in my presentation of that. I may have thinned it out. But particularly to pick up and try to at least slow down the roof water runoff. And you got the aesthetic going. Um, you get a little bit of the filtration through the soil. So it's un unlike the Filterra units that move the water through pretty quickly, the planter boxes are, are generally it's just like taking that vault concept but just bring it up and truly into a planter box and having a series of those that run through so that you're cumulatively managing a volume of water. Like in particular, maybe you are trying to just deal with the roof runoff and feel that you've made good progress because you've dealt with the roof runoff. Um, there are a lot of planter box design specifications out there. You have them in your book. And I don't know if that would have been a good. Oh, sorry. I don't. I, I don't know if that would have been good for this site. The planter boxes. Thoughts? It, they're above ground, and the water ends up going back into the regular stormwater infrastructure. You're not allowing it to infiltrate, so it slows. It lags the water down. Um, They raised a site, like by several feet, because and then they ended up connecting to the city storm drain. After it goes through some of these permeable paving designs, and so the water treatment requirement. That's that's kind of the main BMP on this one, yeah. And I, I something that I'm starting to um, encourage for applicants for on these commercial projects is the planter box design, because if you have enough of them adjacent to the buildings on all sides and all ends and they're deep enough, you can actually get quite a bit yeah. of your retention and water quality requirements met. Um, but other than going to the roof or underneath, you know, that's really kind of one of the main options. Go ahead. Can you pass the microphone back, Tim? Thanks. 
One of the problems with planter boxes immediately adjacent footings is that soils <laughs> engineers get very upset when you put ex uh, That's right. water in expansive soils, which, which affects the footings of the building. Yeah. And the first thing in the code is very specific that all d water shall drain away from a building five feet minimum, and you're not supposed to, you know, saturate the soils. Mm -hmm. So this works against putting planters, I get, just to make a comment, works against okay. the building code and actual structural concepts for buildings. So however that's arranged, if yeah, it's contained, um, if, it's, if it's contained and not infiltrating in the bottom, that's one thing, but then that raises a problem where you might have excess water or, s or moisture and then end up with mosquitoes, so. Sure. So yeah, I know it, it oh, take, no, it just I takes some really specific design. One thing to keep in design. mind, the, plant, the planter box design, um, the issue that you're bringing up is very valid for like that down, I showed a downspout disconnect that uh, down disconnected pretty closely to the building. And there are three, five foot, depending on who you talk to, um, informal standards of keeping that away from the building because of the building footings. The planter box style is actually, unless you knew better, it is a planter box that's above ground, like yay, yay, big, with a tree or shrub or whatever in it, and water is directed to that planter box, and they are connected to other planter boxes. So it's not um, infiltrating or uh, necessarily abutting the building foundation. So you don't, you don't have those same kind of issues with the planter box design. You also don't get, you get less of the infiltrative capacity, but if you can't do infiltration, as I'm, as I'm hearing, um, it's, it's sort of like your second row down type of technique. So planter boxes in general don't, don't cause that kind of structural, but you do need to take that into account for downspout disconnects and bioretention swales that are too close to a building because of the structural integrity of the building. Darla, um, my question is, uh, so right as, the, as the site stands now, there it's very little impervious surface. Depth to groundwater is three feet, so your typical one inch storm is going to be all 100% infiltrated, and, and you have the opportunity to infiltrate a lot of it. Um, in other municipalities, is it ever, uh, do they ever come back to the applicant and say, uh, you know, you're looking to build this site completely out, you know, maybe this just isn't feasible to build um, this large of a complex on this site, you know, and where, you know, you're making it impossible to actually capture all this, all of this stormwater. Um, because it is, it's, d it's doable, it's happening, you know, b the pre-existing conditions is that it is being infiltrated um, in spite of the high ground, you know, yeah. high, relatively high groundwater. It's how much do you cover that site with, and constrain the ability for that process to, to occur. Um, nobody's really going down that line because that comes to the issue of economic vitality and the stormwater requirements. The only city that I've seen in, in our region, you know, Santa Cruz de Carpinteria, that started to take that on a bit more <coughs> is the city of Salinas. Uh, you go into their development standards and they have examples of different scenarios all the way from lot line to lot line to different sort of proportions. And at what proportion does there seem to be a balance between having the big old building and having enough room to get the infiltration. But I don't know how successful they've been politically in doing that. So I just wanted to say one more thing in response, you know, to Chris's comment about building code and that, you know, one option people have is to build their foundation for saturated conditions. And the reason they don't want to do that is because it's way more expensive. Mm -hmm. But that is an option. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's what I've been told. It's an expensive proposition, but it's a possibility to, mm -hmm. to build for saturated conditions. Mm -hmm. I says, what about if you, ap if you do have to put the planter boxes adjacent to the buildings because of space mm -hmm. issues, space constraints, um, waterproofing the planter boxes is an option also, correct? So you can't have planter boxes. Again, it's all, I mean, really, it is just that design of just this open, on, I mean, it's like a planter box. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, be sealed on the bottom and sides. Um, there's a good example, and to try to make this presentation shorter, I took it out. Salinas has on one of their big box stores a bioretention planter box that's on the back of like a Kohl's or something like that. And it, um, you know, here's the building loading zone. 
what they built up was a kind of a concrete or brick structure. Comes out yay far, goes down the length until there's the loading dock. And it comes around and the brook water comes down and goes into that and basically builds up and holds that, hold that water for clamping box. But it's sealed all the way around and at the bottom. So no, no infiltration is allowed, nothing that's going to mess with the structural integrity of the building. But I love the example because they actually fit, in, fit it into where there is a loading dock. And so they fit it into a very high use, heavy trafficked area. Um, the water is basically detained and gets some level of treatment in that soil and with that plants and whatever it can't accommodate. The excess then goes back out into the parking lot and goes down into the regular storm drain. So you can get them flush with the building if you put in the proper, you know, things to, to make sure you're not adversely impacting anything. So it being sealed on the bottom, you've got uh, once it fills up, it's filled up, and the only way out is <coughs> evapotranspiration, right? If, or or you have an under drain oh, or something okay. that allows it allows water to move out. If you did have a really slow flowing under drain and you had water standing in the soil for a long time. Is there, do you know of any um, issues with odor um, when water's, you know, saturated underground, basically? Oh. I haven't heard odor, odor, but more about making sure that it will drain in a timely manner to keep the plants alive. So you're not waterlogging the plants that are in there seems to be like, more like of a concern. underneath a uh, permeable paving lot that has clay, clay soils below it where you have infiltration, mm -hmm. but it may be slow. Mm -hmm. um, successive <coughs> storms, you know, just keep water under, underneath there. Um, so there's not necessarily an odor issue with that. I haven't heard anything about odor. I haven't either. I just, just. Yeah. Was Something that recently came up. The question. Yeah. Huh. yeah, no, I've not. If you, if you hear, tell me, because I've not heard that. Okay. Yeah. So planter boxes then potentially for the site might have added an extra ump, especially to manage some of that roof water. So then between the previous pavement and the roof might have had a bit more covered. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, obviously the only other space to go is to the roofs here. And that's something that Santa Barbara hasn't quite, it hasn't caught on in the city yet much. But as Victoria mentioned, we do have one project that's going strong on the green roof. So maybe we'll have a first. What's the address? West Victoria. You can remember that one. Haha, <laughs> Victoria. What else is just rocking your world in terms of getting this done? Or, you know, I, have to, I guess I have to ask, do you have very many projects coming through that this is being applied to overall? I, I imagined coming here that the lot line to lot line was probably going to be a pretty significant mm -hmm. issue and that re you do a lot of, well, Relatively speaking, you've got redevelopment more than new development, and so a lot of the site planning techniques and things are pretty limited for you. It, it, it is a lot about the structural BMPs. Already so. built out. Tim, can you pass the mic yes. microwave back to Danny? <laughs> well, one thing that this brings to mind is that, you know, by the time we see a project, it's, it's basically fully thought out, right? People, the a developers, time, yeah. need to see, need to be thinking about this stuff way before they ever come to talk to us. Two or three years before they come talk to us. By the time they come talk to us, and we say, "Oh, well, what about, you know, um, swim requirements?" They're like, "Oh, how are we going to fit it into this development that we just spent, you know, three hundred thousand dollars designing?" And so we have to figure out some way to to get this out, way, way earlier into the into the developers' thought process. Before even they even before come they come it. in to with a gleam in the eye of a particular project, by that time you're saying it's almost kind of late because they've, they've already s have an idea of what they want. Yeah, I mean, they've, so. they've, they've spent, yeah, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars before they even, before they even talk to us the mm -hmm. first time. And that's, uh, that's a problem. Do you have a mechanism to get to, um, I mean, do you have lists <coughs> already of your development community? What do, what do you think is the way to do that? Contractors Association. We we have email lists that we can design. send out, but you know, but I don't know how effective that is to get really people thinking about. Here, I really have to think about this, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna make my project go s that much smoother. You know, having a heavy hand with, with a few projects, people will learn the hard ways. Is that right? I mean. Mm. 
That that sounds bad, but I, I don't know if there's no other way. Well, that's what I was thinking that it may be you've got something more stringent here than the rest of the region, at least for the for the time being. I can imagine and am sure that the development community knows that. So they know, I would think that they know coming in or they're learning to know when they come in that they need to need to be thinking about this. Um, and maybe it's just sort of a, the evolution of it that there's there's still folks coming in who are not, haven't caught on. Not aware yet. I don't, yeah, it is, but I do hear that comment a lot. How to, how to get to those folks even before they come in to talk with you. Outreach effort. One of the only solutions. Hi, I'm Ann Coates, and I'm the executive director for the Kachuma Resource Conservation District. Okay. Um, we serve all of Santa Barbara County, parts of Slow County, and parts of Kern County. I do know that there's been quite a bit of success <coughs> with the outreach, com outreach, outreach component in Santa Cruz County with their RCD. The Sink It, uh, Slow It, Spread It, Sink It program was mm -hmm. developed by their RCD. They're also funding um, uh, rainwater catchment systems in the urban area. So I think there's probably a misconception with RCDs that we only provide services to agricultural areas, but we do provide um, um, urban area assistance as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be funding, could be educational outreach programs, and um, just wanted to let you all know that. So if you have any questions, um, I can talk with you later. That's a good point, thanks. Mm -hmm. So we're at time, but you had a second example, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. leave it to you to call what you'd like to do. Yeah, I have a high, well, it's a road example, <laughs> but it's a highway. It's actually a Caltrans project, mm -hmm. and I don't know how much the plans actually work. I'll put them out just in case, but it's something that recently came up, and because the Caltrans, uh, it's an on-ramp, off-ramp project off of Highway 101, and it is within the city jurisdiction, even though it is a state highway project. So the question came up of, well, do they need to deal with our city flip requirements? So I called the regional board and talked to several staff, and the general consensus was yes. You know, technically a state agency needs to comply with the more stringent regulation of whatever jurisdiction they're in. Um, But as I understand it, a state agency isn't always completely open to um, complying with municipal regulations. They look more at their their state general permit and what they're required to do. Um, and it, that's obviously their regulations are not nearly as stringent as the city of Santa Barbara capture and treat requirements. So um, this just gives a little portion of it. But basically, the yellow highlighted area is the highway, that's the main traveled area, and the blue is the shoulder area that's available for any kind of um, uh, BMP or LID implementation. And then there's this white kind of margin curb area where they're um, replacing a sound wall, but there's also some area in there for some landscaping. Um, Basically, the point that I just wanted to drive home here is that the road projects, highway projects, are a major challenge, obviously, because the hardscape and impermeable surface uh, area, you know, highly outtrumps the area open for infiltration, capture, and treatment. So when you're kind of constrained on both sides, and you just have these small margins on each side of the on-ramp, off-ramp, or freeway, um, you know, I have a solution in my mind as to how to approach this kind of thing, um, at least to the maximum extent practicable, but um, there's a lot of resistance to it. And my thought is, you know, uh, you made the point well earlier, which is putting in infiltration devices, whether it's soil amendments or not, depending on the soil that's already there, along the edges of the freeway and in the shoulder areas, and really um, doing a lot of long, shallow, capture and treatment design. Um, rather, obviously, you don't have a place to do one big LID design implementation in this sort of project. So um, just wanted to talk about the constraint of road projects, basically, in general. Caltrans has been doing a lot of work in these past several years on low-impact development. They have staff particularly working on low-impact development design. And uh, I took out the slide in trying to thin this down for this, uh, the t amount of time we had, I had some slides on linear bioretention more for 
major arterial streets and highway, and some of them were done by Caltrans, but it's taking those same concepts, Autumn, of trying to do sort of narrow areas where instead of having um, specific points where the water would come in along the length of, of the highway, for example, the water's just flowing dispersed uh, kind of freely over the roadway because they're trying to get it off the road for uh, safety and into these narrow bioretention areas. They've got requirements, again, because of the public safety element, they don't want cars to be going down into a ditch or hitting something that's you know too soft that they can't get out of. So their designs look a bit different, but there, but there are some designs there, and I can share contact information with you in some of those designs, and you can look at those. Great. Um, but they're getting quite creative, actually, Caltrans, in, in trying to figure this out with narrow areas that they have to deal with because most of it's taken up by the roadway. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, just point to be taken home from the planners in here is that these kind of projects are coming up, and obviously, um, if you're the case planner, a lot of times um, state agencies or other... Um, Anyway, depending on who is bringing the project to the table, they'll try to say, no, you know, we have our own general permit. We're following that route. And technically, we can, you know, push to have them meet our municipal requirements within our, since they're within our jurisdiction, the project. This particular one was of concern because it does drain to the bird refuge. And that's already a major issue of concern for water quality, okay. as we all know. And odor. Yes. Another thing I'd point out as your opportunity on a roadways, and this was back to that idea of alternative compliance that we spoke about earlier, <coughs> if you have opportunities where you can do low impact development, hydromod control, or water quality, and you might be able to uh, take more water or excess, you might be able to essentially give relief to an upstream property that maybe is going lot line to lot line, and they do something, you set up something that's like a fee and loo. So some, sometimes people look to some of these types of roadway areas as actually being potential for meeting not only their own requirements, but potentially additional requirements. It gets complex in terms of the agreements that have to be reached, et cetera, but it starts giving some flexibility and creativity to how to meet stormwater management objectives right. kind of from a bigger scale, not just that one parcel, that one road, or that one lot line to lot line type site. So it's something to keep in mind yeah. for this, perhaps. That's come up as a question a few times. Any other comments or questions, thoughts, before we let Darla go, you guys? We've had some good, I think a lot of our challenges have been touched on. Mm -hmm. It's a good manual. We read your, read your manual. <laughs> good. Thanks, you guys. Okay.